All right. Good afternoon, everybody. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our very first Spring Vanguard virtual series. Um, my name is Mary Landers, and I have the honor of serving as UNCG's alumni director and host of this webinar. It's been a while since we met last November. So many of you joining us today were with us as we gathered and listened to alumna Elizabeth Hudson, 95, our editor-in-chief of Our State Magazine with a wonderful presentation. So through this wonderful virtual world, we now switch gears and have the opportunity to learn more about the College of Visual and Performing Arts with Dean Bruce McClung. Today, we are so pleased to have some new, several new attendees, as a matter of fact, um, who are new to the Vanguard virtual series. So we wanna share just a few um, housekeeping items with you and a special welcome. Um, for those of you who have not done this before, please note that this is a webinar format, which means that you are not able to see other audience members and we on camera. And we do this because it, we have a large audience and that helps reduce the chance of technical issues. After Dean McClung's presentation, we'll open it up for questions. We'll ask that you use the chat fe feature or use the virtual hand feature, and we will unmute you and allow you to ask your question. And I just can't stress this enough. We encourage you to ask questions and be part of the conversation. And I know that Dean McClung would, would love that as well. So with all these details behind us, I'm so excited to present our speaker for today's program. Dr. Bruce McClung began his tenure as the Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts on July 14, 2019. With Dr. McClung's appointment to this role, he is proud to acknowledge that he serves as the inaugural Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts. As the premier, most comprehensive and largest set of visual and performing arts programs in North Carolina, the College of Visual and Performing Arts comprises the School of Art, School of Dance, School of Music, and School of Theater, as well as the Arts Administration Program. An American scholar, Dr. McClung, has received numerous accolades and is the author of the book, Lady in the Dark, Biography of a Musical. Dean McClung received many awards for his book, one of the most prestigious being the Society for American Music Lifetime Service Award presented to him in 2018. Dr. McClung has a baccalaureate degree from the New England Conservatory and a doctorate in musicology from the University of Rochester's Eastman School of Music. From a personal standpoint, I want to acknowledge Dean McClung's active interest in our UNCG alumni and most particularly our Vanguard alumni. For those of you who may not be familiar with the term, our Vanguard alumni represent alumni who have celebrated their 50th reunion. Right now, our Vanguard population boasts over 12,500 alumni. I recall a very special event in Asheville before the pandemic. This is one of Dean McClung's very first Vanguard events. He had the audience singing the alma mater and sharing stories about their time at Women's College, UNCG. I knew at that moment that Dean McClung was a perfect fit for UNCG. He is always so gracious with his time and he's always enthusiastically said yes anytime I've asked him to be part of an alumni program. Dean McClung, thank you so much for being with us today. I know the audience is looking forward to learning more about you and the College of CVPA. So welcome, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that wonderful introduction. It's great to be here today uh, to be part of this virtual Vanguard series. I'm going to share my screen with you all. So it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to thank Mary Landers for the invitation and to Jill Ingram for her technical assistance. Uh, my presentation will run about 30 minutes, which will leave us plenty of time for questions. The title of my remarks today is Preparing for a Life in the Arts. My presentation will be in four parts. The first part, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Second, I'll trace the history of the College of Visual and Performing Arts. 
third, I'll tell you about some of the interesting career paths of our alumni. And finally, I'll share what's new in the college. So starting with a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in the Mojave Desert of California, which has the distinction of being the hottest place on earth. Um, hell, as we all know, is the hottest place, but the Mojave Desert is the second hottest place. When most of us think about the desert, we think about saguaro cactus, which are actually from the Sonoran Desert. And the desert that I come from, the indicator species is the Joshua tree. So if you see Joshua trees, then you are indeed in the Mojave Desert. They usually grow about 1,300 to 5,900 feet above sea level and are often found in the passes between the valleys of the Mojave Desert. The hottest place on earth is Death Valley. And I grew up a couple of valleys over in a place called the Indian Wells Valley. This is a photograph, not a painting, of the valley that I grew up in. There's a naval base there called China Lake. And the base was founded in 1943 during the Second World War as a weapons development base. Uh, my mother was an artist and an oil painter, and she most often painted this scene of Owens Peak shown here, which is the mountain range that dominates the valley. I spent my childhood wandering across the desert, catching lizards and snakes, which I would put in a pillowcase and then bring home much to the consternation of my mother. You don't really need a lot of sailors in the middle of the desert. So the US Naval Ordnance Test Station, or NOTS as it was first called, later to be renamed China Lake, has a very small military presence and has a very large civilian population of engineers, chemists, and physicists. My father was an electrical engineer who worked on the Sidewinder missile, which recently was in the news since it shot down that balloon sent by China. It also sent, uh, it hit a weather balloon, um, which was a rather expensive endeavor. My father, because he was an electrical engineer, was fascinated with the theater organ. So he purchased a theater organ for our house on the base, and I began to take organ lessons. This was the uh, original main gate to the base, and I would need to show a pass to be able to get onto the base to go home. And growing up, I thought that everybody had a pass to go home where they lived. And I was rather surprised the first time we went to San Diego to visit my grandmother that there was no fence and no guard station around San Diego. Sometime around the time I was 12, um, I began to uh, take classical organ lessons at the All Faith Chapel on the base. The All Faith Chapel held Roman Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish services all within the same complex. And the All Faith Chapel offered a scholarship in organ. So around the age of 12, I made the transition from glissandos of the theater organ to the counterpoint of J.S. Bach. This was the organ at the All Faith Chapel where I studied and practiced. Across the street from the All Faith Chapel was the base movie theater. And my parents and their friends started a concert series similar to the university concert and lecture series here at UNCG, where I got to hear such artists as Van Cliburn and Yasha Heifetz, and uh, who all performed in the movie theater. So after graduating from high school, I spent my freshman year at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. And then I transferred to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. And that's where I earned a Bachelor of Music in organ performance. And I spent about 40 years of my life as a church organist, 
I had my first church job at age 19, and I um, left my last job at the age of 59. And so being a church organist has been a real constant through most of my adult life. For graduate school, I attended the University of Rochester's Eastman School of Music, where I earned a master's of an organ. And as a lark, near the end of this degree, there was a class listed on 19th century autographs. And I thought that sounded like a fascinating class, working with Beethoven, Schumann, and Liszt autographs from the Sibley Music Library. And that was a turning point. And so I became interested in musicology or the academic study of music or music history. And I did a Master of Arts in Musicology at Eastman. I then applied for PhD programs in musicology and considered returning to Boston where I had been accepted at Harvard, but I decided to stay in Rochester where I ended up earning my PhD in musicology. I then spent 27 years at the University of Cincinnati's College Conservatory of Music, first as a musicology professor, and then as a division head of composition, musicology, and music theory. The last two years I spent as interim dean. The College Conservatory of Music, or CCM, is a multidisciplinary arts college with fields of electronic media, film and media, dance, music, and theater, all situated within a research university. As Mary Landers mentioned in 2019, I came here to UNCG to become the inaugural Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts or CVPA. CVPA is similar to CCM in that it's a multidisciplinary arts college, art, dance, music, and theater within a research university setting. And um, I've given you a photograph of the music building, the new music building as we call it, because that's where my office is located. And uh, that's a photograph of the Elizabeth Herring Memorial Garden uh, where I ate my lunch today. So this concludes the first part of my presentation. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the College of Visual and Performing Arts. And I'll share some kind of fun facts about the college. So CBPA is actually the newest academic unit at UNCG. It was established in 2016. So from 1922 to 2010, the unit was called the School of Music. And in 2010, theater came over from the College of Arts and Sciences and dance from the School of Health and Human Sciences to make the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. And in 2016, art joined from the College of Arts and Sciences and so the unit was renamed the College of Visual and Performing Arts. And it consists of four departments or schools, a school of art, a school of dance, a school of music, and a school of theater. So a little bit about each one. So the School of Art is our largest unit with 537 students and 26 full-time faculty. The degrees offered are the Bachelor of Arts, the Bachelor of Fine Arts, and the Masters of Fine Arts. And the School of Art is primarily housed in the Gatewood Studio Arts Building off of Spring Garden Street. Degrees are offered in art history, arts administration, art education, and studio art. Painting and drawing, printmaking, photography, ceramics and sculpture, and new media and design. And I always feel like I'm kind of honoring my mother who was an artist um, by going to the exhibits of the School of Art. Um, and uh, we visited lots of museums as children growing up. And so I have a lifelong love of art, even if I'm not an artist myself. 
So we go from our largest school to our smallest school, and that's the School of Dance. It has 140 students and nine full-time faculty. It's housed in the Coleman Building, and the photograph that you're seeing used to be a swimming pool. And when you were students here, perhaps you swam uh, in, in this room, but now it's the main dance studio. The same three degrees are offered here, but in dance studies, dance education, and studio dance. The primary focus is on contemporary dance, but we also teach African dance and jazz dance. And students also study ballet. The School of Music is the oldest unit. It turned 100 years old last year. It has 493 students and 54 full-time faculty. It offers all the degrees from Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Music through the master's degree to the Doctor of Musical Arts and the PhD. The school is divided into three divisions, music studies, which comprises composition, music history, music theory, ethnomusicology, music education, and then music performance. The School of Theater is turning 100 years this year, and it's medium-sized with 314 students and 21 full-time faculty. It's housed in the Brown Building, the old music building, and Taylor Theater, shown here. The BA, BFA, and MFA degrees are offered in acting and directing, musical theater, theater education, and then design and technical theater, costume design, lighting design. Taylor Theater will be closing this spring for a $10.5 million renovation the first renovation of Taylor Theater since it opened in 1967. So in addition to our majors, we also offer minors. In, uh, we offer 16 different minors, meaning that our college serves many more students than just our majors. So oftentimes students may be majoring in biology or chemistry or English or history, but they might have a minor in photography or in printmaking. So we have 16 different minors and those are listed here in alphabetical order. This is a fun infographic in that it shows that our students come from 33 of the 50 states. All the states that are shaded in dark blue uh, have students at CVPA currently studying and our students come from seven different countries. The circular graphic, it looks a little bit like an upside down peace symbol, shows that art and music are our largest populations, theater and dance are smaller, and arts administration students make up about 5% of our student body. Many students double major in arts administration and another major within our college. So for example, music, and arts administration double major is fairly popular. This is another fun infographic. Where is CVPA? Uh, we're located in 15 different buildings, both on campus and off campus. So if you see number one here, um, that is our Studio 91 in the Cone Residence Hall. So it's an actual uh, performing arts living community. And then uh, our college also is in charge of managing the UNCG auditorium, number two. The School of Art is primarily in the Maud Gatewood Studio Arts Building, but the senior studios are over here in Highland Hall. And our art history faculty are in the Weatherspoon Art Museum. And then we have a lighting studio here at Gate and Tate for our photography program. And then not shown on the map is Greensboro Project Space. So if you took West Market Street all the way down to Elm and hung a right and then a left on Fe East February 1 place near the Civil Rights Museum, that's our downtown art gallery. 
School of Dance is all located here in the Coleman Building. And then the School of Music has the largest footprint on campus. It's all here in number nine, the Music Building. School of Theater is located in four buildings along Tate Street. So that includes Taylor Theater here, and then the Brown Building or the Old Music Building. Then we have our costume shop at 326 Tate Street and the acting and lighting studio at 328 Tate Street. Used to be an old movie theater and then was a bookstore. And then over here off the map on Lily Street is our scene shop. So those are the 15 different buildings where you'll find CVPA. In terms of our alumni, many of our alumni stay right here in the Piedmont Triad. So you can see that we have 2,838 alumni right in the triad. Our next largest group of alumni are here in the research triangle. And then we have large groups of alumni in Charlotte, Asheville, and Wilmington. Our arts education majors are teaching in schools in all 100 counties of North Carolina. Across the country, our largest group of alumni are in New York City, second largest Washington, DC, third largest Atlanta, fourth largest Los Angeles with the film industry. And then our fifth largest group of alumni nationally are in Chicago. Our college uh, is very big on alumni engagement and Terry Relos, our director of uh, external relations holds events in various cities where we have networks of alumni. So these are all the net alumni network events that we've held this year. This Sunday, I'll be in Atlanta for an alumni brunch. And then next month, we'll be going to Los Angeles and to Raleigh, and then finally to New York and Chicago. These gatherings are a chance for alumni to network with one another to hear about what's happening on campus and to stay connected to UNCG. So the third part of my presentation today will be a little bit about our alumni and some of the new paths that they're blazing in the arts. So I'll start with our alumna, Carla Gaines. She received a BFA in 1992 she originally was a painter, but she's transitioned into being a video artist. And she's currently a faculty member at New York University, NYU. And um, this was in December in New York. Carla had an exhibit on the High Line. And the work behind her is titled Carla Gaines, The Elevated Line, and is shown on a huge video board in the Ryan Lee Gallery. So it was fun being there, it was very cold, but Carla had a number of people who were there to see her video installation. A more recent art alumna is Grace Clark, who earned her MFA in 2021. This is a teardrop trailer that she built herself. It looks like it's parked uh, on the Mojave Desert. She traveled around the country for about six months working as a pizza vendor at music festivals and then pursuing her art as a photographer. She's created artist residencies called Overland Artworks, and it's a web-based residency program for other artists that follows the psychological aspects of an artist residency without the physical ones. As she writes, I wanted to help people who don't have a lot of resources get a leg up in the art world. And so Grace is very much blazing a new path for herself in art. In dance, another recent graduate is Shayla Watson who earned her BFA in 2020. She first learned about the professional company, the Urban Bush Women, in Professor Anapala Huffling's course. And at the end of that class, she told Professor Huffling that one day she wanted to dance professionally with the urban bush women. And believe it or not, she's currently an apprentice with the company. And we were thrilled to have her back this fall when she appeared with the urban bush women 
on the University Concert and Lecture Series 110th uh, anniversary season. So it's amazing that students get a spark or an inkling of what they want to do, and then they follow their path and make it happen. Another exciting alumna from dance is Chelsea Hilding. She earned her MFA just last May, and she taught a very popular course here on campus titled Ballet for Everybody. And she's made it her mission to introduce ballet to all different body types in what she calls progressive ballet pedagogy. And she was the recipient of our Outstanding Teaching Assistant Award. She's moved to New York City. She's the company manager for the Gibney Performing Arts Center. And in her spare time, she's pursuing a PhD program with a low residency requirement at Texas Women's University. Moving on to music, this is Tanner West. Uh, he graduated from the School of Music in 2018 with his Bachelor in Music in Horn. He's a native North Carolinian who first attended the School of Music Summer Music Camp. After graduation, he played with several orchestras here in North Carolina and pursued a master's certificate at the Colburn School. We are really thrilled because in December, he won through international audition, the fourth horn position in the New York Philharmonic. So uh, we were just beside ourselves to imagine that an alumnus from uh, five years ago is now a member of the New York Philharmonic. Another musician who's, who's um, really has his own path is Brendan Slocum. He received a Bachelor of Music in Music Education in 1994, moved to Washington, DC, where he freelances as a violinist and has a studio in his own home. Brendan wrote his first book during the COVID pandemic called The Violin Conspiracy. It's a thriller, a detective story, uh, with the musical bent. And it ended up on the New York Times bestseller list. When I had dinner with Brendan in November, he reported that his second book is already with the publisher and he was uh, midway writing his third book. And he's really created a whole genre of musical thrillers. And we welcomed him back here to Greensboro last spring for the Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Finally, uh, Margaret Haig earned her Bachelor of Music and Voice in 2011. She's a specialist in early music, and she lives in New York City where she sings with Trinity Wall Street's professional choir, and then she freelances around the country. I heard her with the Charlotte Bach Festival last spring in a concert in Asheville, and it's been really exciting to follow her career. Finally, in theater, Hugh Heisel is a true Renaissance man. He graduated with his BFA in acting in 1988 and has done almost everything you can imagine in the theater. He's a working actor, still takes auditions, but he's invested his money in two Broadway productions that have won the Tony Award. During the pandemic, it was his own company that were the ones with the mask up signs in the Broadway theaters. He had literally hundreds of employees making sure that folks wore their masks while in the theater. Last fall, when I had lunch with Hugh, he said he really wanted to pass on some of the opportunities that are available in the theater with our current students. So I mentioned this to Natalie Soule, the director of our School of Theater, and this semester, Hugh is teaching a course via Zoom called The Business of Show. Rather than show business, it's The Business of Show, which is really the opening the eyes of our current students of all that the theater has to offer. Four years ago, the School of Theater started its musical theater program. And last year, 265 high school students auditioned for just seven spots, making the acceptance rate for UNCG's musical theater program just 2.3%. At 
As a comparison, Harvard Medical School has an acceptance rate of 3.7%. So as I like to tell the parents of our musical theater students, it would have been easier for their offspring to attend Harvard Medical School than UNCG's musical theater program. Our very first graduate from the musical theater program, Kamari Bryant, earned his BFA in 2021, and he's currently on tour with the Book of Mormon, which opens tonight at the Stephen Tanger Center for the Performing Arts here in Greensboro. I'll be having dinner uh, tonight and then going to see the Book of Mormon with Kamari Bryant in the cast. I can't wait. So the last part of my presentation will be what's new in the College of Visual and Performing Arts. This fall, we launched four new degree concentrations. The first is within the BFA in studio art. So in addition to painting and drawing, ceramics, sculptures, new media design, photography, now students can concentrate in animation which is used in film, video games, advertisements, marketing, augmented reality, virtual reality, and in entertainment and media. Our very first assistant professor of animation is Dan Hale. And this is a flyer that he created showing all the different types of animation that are currently taught as part of the curriculum. We also have Heather Holian, a professor of art history, who's a historian of the Disney and Pixar studios. So our new concentration combines the making of animation with the study of animation. Our second new concentration is within the Bachelor of Music, Music Education, and it's a new concentration in jazz education. Traditionally in music education, students choose either an instrumental track in which case they become a band teacher in high schools and middle schools, or a vocal track, and then they become a choral director in um, a choir director in middle and high schools. This is a third new track in jazz education. And um, this is for uh, students who are interested in teaching jazz in middle or high schools. This is a photograph of our jazz studies and music education faculty members who created this new concentration, which is the first in the UNC system. Our third new concentration is a concentration again in the Bachelor of Music and Performance, but it's in popular music and technology. Uh, created by composition professor Mark Engelbretson, it's aimed at students who learn to play music by playing in a band rather than singing in a choir or playing in an orchestra, or who are singer-songwriters, or who love to rap. And this concentration is aimed both at creating popular music, but also working in the recording industry. And this is our first year, and we have a full cohort of 15 students and it's our fastest growing program in the School of Music. This is a flyer for these two new concentrations, jazz education and popular music technology in the School of Music. So I think we're starting our second century of the School of Music with some exciting new developments. Our last new concentration is within the MFA in drama in the School of Theater. And so I brought Dominic Amendum, our artist in residence, and School of Music faculty in conducting and collaborative piano together. And they created a new concentration that's aimed at teaching conductors who want to work in the theater pit conducting Broadway musicals. Dominic Amendum, shown here in the blue shirt, spent a decade with the musical Wicked on Broadway and he'll now be training the next generation of Broadway music directors. So this is the way that the College of Visual and Performing Arts is staying on the cutting edge of arts education with these new concentrations in animation, jazz education, popular music and technology, and music theater directing.
As part of the UNCG Light the Way campaign, we're trying to increase the scholarship support for our students. Currently, the average scholarship is $1,000 across all disciplines, which covers about 13% of tuition. And our goal is to try to get the average scholarship up to $2,000 or 27% of tuition. There are many ways that you can support the students in the college who are pursuing a life in the arts. You can give online, you can mail uh, us a check, you can do a monthly bank draft or a credit card charge, or even a gift of stock. We're very grateful for everyone who supports the students of this college. So thank you for your attention. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. I've enjoyed my time with you here today, and now I'll be happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Bruce, thank you. That was wonderful. I learned so much. I didn't realize that you had 15 different buildings, and I've been here 10 years. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I especially appreciated hearing about how you meet with current students from Kamari, Hugh, and uh, Brendan, um, just to name a few. But how special that as a dean that you take that time to, to meet with the students, and I'm sure they really appreciate that very much. So we'll, uh, if you all have a question, please put it in chat or hit your um, raise hand icon and we will get to you. But um, Bruce, I do have a couple of questions that were sent in ahead of time. And so I'll start that um, process if that's all right with you. Uh, the first is about your the concert and lecture series. And the question is, uh, there's always such a diverse range of artists featured in your series. Do you think these artists perceive UNCG as a destination venue? That's a great question. Um, we work with many of the same agents to bring artists in to the University Concert and Lecture Series. And these agents know that UNCG has a reputation of doing things right. But we have a partnership with Coynton's Weaver Restaurants and Hotels. They're one of our sponsors. So our artists are put up either at the O'Henry Hotel or the Proximity Hotel mm -hmm. here in yes. town. We really go the extra mile in making sure they have the right color of M&Ms in their dressing room <laughs> or whatever they've requested. And uh, we take a lot of pride in the programs that we prepare. And all of the artists who appear on the series either do a talk back or an actual master class with our current students. So I think uh, the series has been around for 110 years, mm -hmm. and we've developed a reputation as a small series that does things right. We're the oldest continuous lecture and concert series in the state of North Carolina. So we're very proud of the reputation. I know many alums talk about hearing Robert Frost mm. or uh, many of the luminaries, Philip Glass, who've appeared on the University Concert and Lecture Series. And for many of our students who are first generation students who are Pell eligible, they may not have ever had the opportunity or the financial means to hear artists of this caliber. Yeah. UCLS series uh, student tickets are $5 a piece. So it's less expensive to hear a world-class artist than to go see a movie in a movie theater or to rent something off of Netflix. And we purposefully keep student tickets at the absolute bare minimum because we want to expose as many students to world-class artists who come on the university concert and lecture series. That's marvelous. It's interesting that you mentioned Robert Frost because I had a, a conversation with Sue Medley, class of 65 last week, and she was talking about that very experience that she had. So it just it just goes to show how how that transcends for them and how long that memory has lasted. So that's that's wonderful. We do have a couple of questions. Alice Irby, hi Alice, uh, wants to know, are the student bodies growing in all of these programs or in some of them? It's a great question, Alice. As you know, the university as a whole is down in enrollment. Um, because of the pandemic, some students have decided to put off going to college. Also, 18 years ago in North Carolina, the birth rate began to fall. And so what that means is we have fewer 18-year-olds graduating from high school. So all 16 of the 
schools in the UNC system are experiencing declining enrollments. I'm really pleased to say that this year we have one more student than we did last year. So that's 0.07% enrollment growth. And so, uh, as I like to remind folks, we're part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so uh, our enrollment has kept steady. But um, in terms of the four disciplines, Alice, I think that's where your question was directed. Art is our fastest growing discipline uh, by far. Um, dance has remained pretty steady. Theater has seen a slight decline and music has seen a slight decline. I think the reason for this is during COVID, you think about it, high schools did not have marching bands. They didn't have choirs. They didn't have theater productions. So for over two years, students who might have really gotten interested in majoring in music or majoring in theater didn't have the opportunity in high school to participate in music and theater. So I think that may be some of the reason why we're seeing a slight decline in those two disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. Um, Marsha Driscoll, hi, Marsha. Uh, she wants to ask you what opportunities are available for students who wish to participate in the arts, but who are neither majors nor minors in your college? Another great question. So um, our orchestra has members playing in it from all over campus. So it could be a biology major with a minor in chemistry who's in the cello section or a history major with a minor in sustainability studies playing in the woodwind. So you don't have to be a school of music major or minor to play in the orchestra or in the band. Same with the choirs. We have choirs that are available to anybody on campus. Um, other ways that students can participate in the arts without being majors. Let me think about that a minute. Um, our dance program holds what they call High School Dance Day. That's this coming weekend where they invite high school dance classes to come and dance in that beautiful studio that used to be the swimming pool <laughs> and to take classes with our faculty. Some of those students have decided to come to UNCG based on High School Dance Day, but they're not dance majors. Um, so sometimes people visit the campus through the arts, but then elect to major in something else. That's, that's good to know. And how many of them just dabble enough that then they become interested, right? And make that their, their life's passion. That's wonderful. Um, one, uh, another question that we have is um, they were looking at your demographic and noting the large uh, population numbers in Washington, DC and wanted to hear why you think that is, because it doesn't seem to them to be a traditional place that someone would land. It's a great question. Washington, D.C. has the Kennedy Center, and we have people who sing in the Kennedy Center Chorus and who are also in the National Opera Chorus. So I think the draw of the Kennedy Center may have something to do with it. Also, it's it's a big city that's not so far away from North Carolina. Um, maybe not as scary as New York okay. for an 18 year old. Um, and I think sometimes is perceived as a city with sort of maybe more opportunities than New York. Maybe it's not quite as cutthroat. So we've had some of our theater alums uh, live in Washington, D.C., uh, opera people. Mm -hmm. Brendan Slocum, who wrote The Violin Conspiracy, he lives in Washington. So I, my guess is that maybe the Kennedy Center and the focus of the arts in Washington, D.C., there is certainly a great support for the arts in the nation's capital. Um, and the fact that it's only five hours away from right. Greensboro. So that may have something to do with it. Those are some great points. And certainly that ones that I wouldn't have thought of. So unless uh, in the q and I have one more that was sent in. Um, so if you, we're getting ready to wrap up. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A or raise your hand. But um, Bruce, the, the other one I have, someone commented on your presentation about the Taylor Theater being renovated and just wanting to know what those primary renovations would be. 
Yeah, this is this is a difficult topic. So when I interviewed here, I was told by the then school director, John Poole, that they needed $10 million for a theater renovation. So the very first memo I ever wrote was about the HVAC system in Taylor Theater. And the HVAC system, the air conditioning and the heating, dates from 1967. Wow. Mm. And it frequently fails even during performances. And so we've had to have an electrician on call during performances in case the whole theater goes wow. dark. Wow. So unfortunately, a large portion of the $10.5 million is going to go to an entirely <laughs> new HVAC system that will work well and be very quiet and not interrupt performances when it turns on. There will also, we believe, will be new seats. And there's currently a seat campaign. And alumni of the School of Theater are naming seats. And you'll have a little brass plaque with your name and year on a seat in Taylor Theater. Um, the rigging above the stage will also be replaced. Some of those um, steel cables are nearing the ends of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a lot of infrastructure, plumbing, electricity, HVAC, you know, all those sort of very expensive things when you do home repair mm -hmm. are sort of at the top of the list. And more cosmetic things like the exterior are not. So Taylor Theater may end up looking from the outside very similar to how it looks today, but certainly the mechanicals of Taylor Theater will be state of the art. Wonderful. Um, I, I appreciate the the um, comparison to home. Like you got to put you got to put all the money in the things that aren't quite as sassy, right? No, but it has to be done. It has to be done. I see that two people raised their hand. Jill, can you help me a little bit? Um, I'm not able to see that Sue, Sue Pig. Are you, Sue, are you able to unmute her, Jill? I just unmuted Sue. Okay, Sue, we're ready for your question. Nope, Sue, are you there? Sue, it looks like you're muted. Yeah. I there think, we go. There we go, Sue. Okay, it's not a question. I just want to say to Dr. McClung, this has been a wonderful presentation today. And I just want to share a memory where the new uh, uh, dance studio is, where the swimming pool used to be. I'm a 1953 graduate, and I tried to get a learning swimming class from my first semester freshman year. I finally succeeded in my, the last semester of my senior year, 1953, and got to learn to swim. Oh. But I'm happy for you that you have a lovely dance. <laughs> now. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And Jill, I thought we had one more. Uh, are we clear on the questions? Mary, yes, that was a, um, that was, that hand was raised in air. So I okay. think- Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Bruce, thank you. I mean, what wonderful information and just affirmation of what a wonderful, wonderful college we have and how thankful and grateful we are for your leadership. You are one busy man, <laughs> for sure. And you do it with grace and charm. I just want to reiterate that. You always say yes every time I ask you something, and I know how busy you are. So thank you so much. Thank and you. And to our audience, we'll be back on March 21st. And we, our guest speaker will be Scott Henshaw, and he is talking about university archives and, and the process of preserving UNCG history. So Bruce, any last words you'd like to, to say before we say goodbye? I would say if you're interested in learning more, um, our college puts out a monthly e-newsletter mm -hmm. and I write a column for that. And I believe it was our November issue was all about the building of the UNCG auditorium. And I did oh, wow. uh, research and uh, rare books and archives in the library. And there's a really nice um, photographic essay that goes along with it. So you can literally see the building being built. So um, I could put in the chat a link for the archive of all of our college's newsletters. And um, that might be interesting for folks if they want to learn anything oh, more. Wonderful. About and we can college. also, Bruce, we can also, we follow up with everybody after this to send them the link, and we can probably include that in that email as well. 
So, okay, that's but that is a great good. idea. Great idea. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. We appreciate you so much. Thank you to our audience and we'll see you in March. Bye-bye.